Well, good morning. Good morning to Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. But I'm not at the Marxist Library. And for the most part, we, <coughs> excuse me, we haven't been meeting physically at the library, though recently we've tried to do a few hybrid meetings, Zoom and um, in person at, at the library. So um, I'll say good morning to those few in the Pacific time zone, uh, to Richard Wright, who's in the um, Republic of Texas, it's good afternoon. And um, to, um, I don't know if Mike Gilbert is with us this morning um, in across the pond, uh, that would be good evening. Um, and just so very much welcome to coming to the Marxist Library. And, um, we're excited about this program. My name is Roger Harris. I'm on the program committee. And we've been doing these programs for a decade and a half. And we're very proud of that. It's um, one of the sort of ongoing institutions. And what we're particularly proud about is that this has become a forum for comradely discussion, for an open discussion of ideas amongst, amongst comrades in, in a very cordial and friendly atmosphere. Um, the particular program today that we're having is, um, oh, oh sorry, I should say, our motto. Our motto is that um, we take our motto from Karl Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach. And Marx said, quote, philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways the point, however, is to change it. And along that theme, today's program is particularly relevant. It's a very relevant topic. It deals with the issues of the war in Ukraine and the larger ideological context of imperialism and how the imperialist system works and the, our understandings of imperialism. And I would want to emphasize that within the left, there is a broad consensus against endless war, for diplomacy, and for peace in Ukraine. And that's become a very important demarcation point because earlier times, I can remember the Vietnam period when a lot of liberals were for, for peace. That's not so much the case today. I and mean, we may be um, addressing that. So we've had a number of speakers um, address this issue of imperialism, how we understand this particular era that we're in, and how that applies. And our speaker today is particularly qualified to speak on that topic. Greg Godels has been a longtime scholar and activist. Um, he recently wrote an article, Imperialism Re Revisited. He also has a blog spot. I highly recommend that you um, follow his blog. If someone could put that into the chat, I'd truly, truly appreciate that. Um, and a little bit about Greg's background. He comes from a working class family. He came from a rural coal mining community. He joined the Communist Party USA in 1975 and served on the party's economic ec economics commission until Victor Perlow's death. He wrote frequently for the Daily World and other party papers, as well as political affairs, the, the publication Political Affairs, and also the publication Nature, Science, and Thought. Articles by him have also appeared in numerous other publications, including the Communist Review, which comes out of London, People's Voice, which comes out of Vancouver, and the Socialist Voice, which comes out of Dublin. He was a joint founder of the Marx uh, the, of the website Marxism Marxism Leninism today very important website again I hope someone will put that um, blog site um, in, into the into the chat um, and he sometimes writes under the pen name of Zoltan Ziggy so I'm going to ask Greg to present we'll have about a 45 to 50 minute presentation then we'll take a little break and then we'll go into a robust Q&A and um, try to end up about 12.30. So Greg, if you could take it away, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Roger, for a very kind and, and, and too generous introduction. 
Um, uh, I should I should note that I'm using new technology for me. I'm not technologically very adept. So should I break up or something get uh, discontinued, please interrupt me. I know that's not your policy, but that will help me if, if uh, something happens. So uh, let me begin. I'm sure all of you are aware uh, of what a deep, profound crisis we're in, uh, the world is in, uh, from uh, this stagflation, this economic uh, crisis that's, uh, that's hit us um, with low growth or no growth or negative growth and high inflation, which is just pillaging uh, working people around the world. The environmental crisis, which, you know, I, the newspaper is the only thing that our bourgeois press gets right is they do tell us the truth about all the disasters that are happening around the world from the environment. You're all familiar with that. And most recently, a crisis arising from the war in Ukraine. And uh, that's particularly close to me. I've been writing about it since 2005 on my blog and on uh, Marxism Leninism Today. Uh, that was uh, in the aftermath of the so called Orange um, Revolution, which was that put up job to deposed the then president of, of Ukraine who became the president again and then got deposed again. In any case, I've followed Ukrainian politics fairly closely. And uh, for, on the blog, I've, I've corresponded with some folks in, in Ukraine who followed me in that early period. Someone mentioned Consortium News uh, before we were on. Uh, they recently bragged about following Ukraine since 2014. And, I must say, I've been looking at it a bit longer than that. And I think you need to look at it a bit longer than that to really understand how profoundly, deeply this war has really been going on. It's not a new thing, but it became a hot war uh, this year. So I'm on, a, I'm on, a, uh, I'm on a, a corner in Pittsburgh with 12 other people, February 19th on a Saturday. It's bitter cold and we're protesting a coming war or what may be a war in Ukraine. We have signs that say no war in Ukraine, uh, uh, NATO out of Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. Five days later, a war breaks out. Uh, I call it an invasion. Some of you are more inclined to call it a special operation. It's just words, but the war began in earnest uh, then. So I was struck in the aftermath of the beginning of the war. Uh, weeks go by and there's very little response from the left. There's lots of commentary, lots of talk, lots of blame, but very little uh, instigation of an anti-war movement, of a peace movement, of a sense of the, the destruction that war brings and how we can stop that. So for weeks after that, I, I couldn't understand why there was no such movement. And I began to think, well, maybe I ought to go back and read imperialism again more carefully and just see you know, what, what sense I can make out of this. And that became the beginning of a series of, of articles I wrote, seven articles from March through September on the war, on the soft left, that left which is coddled up to the United States and supported the United States um, intervention and instigation of this war. Uh, then the people I consider my comrades, the hard left, who in many cases are apologizing for, for Russia's role in this war. They see Russia as uh, an anti-imperialist instrument of some kind or another. So I thought this calls for some study. So I went back uh, to my sources, which would be Lenin's book, Imperialism, and I reread it. And uh, uh, it made me think again about some of the things I assumed about imperialism. So let me begin by taking you through a uh, brief, but hopefully uh, insightful look at the idea and its history. First of all, I think it's important to separate empires from imperialism. Empires have existed for a long time. They go back to ancient times. The Egyptian empire, the Inca empire, the Aztec empire in, in, uh, in, in, in America, North and South America. And uh, of course, we're familiar as Westerners, over familiar with the Roman empire. But they had very little in common. They shared one thing, and that was a mode of production, which was based upon labor power. Uh, they were essentially the, the expansion of these empires was based upon grabbing people to work, slaves, 
and and stealing wealth. That was essentially what uh, that was about. But you have to you have to bear in mind that scholars and commentators they don't consider that imperialism. They talk about the empires, but not a system of imperialism. And of course, that carried over into medieval medieval times in Europe with the Holy Roman Empire and the other nostalgic empire, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and so forth. But that's not what we're talking about when we talk about imperialism. That really begins with the misnamed Age of Discovery, when Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, the Dutch, all uh, developed, uh, productive forces developed in Europe to the point where new technologies, uh, shipbuilding, navigation, and so on, allowed these, these uh, Europeans to travel around the world and really snatch colonies, create colonies. And it was a time of what I would call proto-imperialism. It's the first age of imperialism, but it's not what we now know as imperialism. And it's no accident that it's connected with proto-capitalism, with the development of, of uh, early manufacturing, uh, cottage industries, and so on and the accumulation of the capital that would later build the massive industrialization of capitalism. It was, uh, it was justified. I mean, the, the idea of going to Asia, to Africa, to uh, the Americas and taking over, uh, wiping out the indigenous people, um, calling it your own, that was justified by what was called the discovery doctrine which was uh, agreed between these powers and the church in 1452. And what it essentially said was, if you weren't a Christian, it wasn't yours, it was ours. So that's kind of the roots of our imperialism, but it's not our imperialism. Uh, near the end of that earlier era, after the French Revolution, there was a, an interesting, interesting empire. It was Napoleon Bonaparte's empire where he set out in the beginning to bring republicanism by force to Europe and other places. And this is, to me, this is the first attempt to import bourgeois democracy to the world. It didn't last long, it became a bona fide old guard empire quickly. One of the admirers, I'm sure some of you know, was Beethoven, who in the beginning, along with a number of other intellectuals and um, prominent people, Romantics in that era saw, saw, saw Napoleon as an, a liberator, but after the pillage began, they of course uh, woke up and he, uh, he scorned uh, Napoleon from that time on. It's a kind of a prototype, if you reflect on it, and I don't know that anyone's written about it, but it's a kind of a prototype of U.S. version, the U.S. Uh, approach to imperialism. Uh, it's, it's, it's importing or exporting democracy to other places. Interesting thing, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century, there was a long period of stability and peace in Europe, which led many to believe that you could have both imperialism and peace and stability. But then in 1870, until the World War I, what happened was something that scholars at that time called the new imperialism. John Hobson was one of the pioneers in, in unfolding that and ex explaining that and, and popularizing that notion of the new imperialism. His book, Imperialism, a Study, documented that in that short span from 1871 to 1901, 38 distinct regions in Asia, Africa, and even Europe were acquired, quote unquote, acquired by European powers. Those powers at that time, the big powers, had met in 1878 and they had tried to stabilize what was becoming unstable. The, the Treaty of Berlin was established between Germany, France, Britain, Russia, Austria, Hungary, and Italy at that time. And the notion was to stabilize this, this takeover of the rest of the world. And then of course, the war, the war occurred and the war was most, most people, the well, bourgeois, bourgeois historiography calls that, uh, uh, kind of an accident that happened with the assassination of uh, Archduke uh, Ferdinand. But that's not the way other people looked at it. And when the war began, there was a small minority of people in the Marxist movement, not the majority of the Marxist movement, not the uh, majority of social democracy, but a small group that resisted that war while the others uh, capitulated to the war in 1914. 
And incidentally, that was the first and last time that era where the US was the center of anti-imperialist activity with the formation of the Anti-Imperialist League in 1898. Talk about a broad movement that stretched from Andrew Carnegie to Samuel Gompers, Mark Twain, Jane Addams, Henry James, really a, a major, almost a majority of the people in this country opposed US imperialism. It was the same era in which the two upstart imperialist powers, uh, capitalist powers, emerging capitalist powers, one of their own empires, Japan and the United States. But the war begins, and for the most part, the left capitulated to the war. The left surrendered, urged people to fight for their national causes and so on. And of course, the, the standouts, the stalwarts that stayed against this were people like Vladimir Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Leibniz, and really literally a few hundred other people. And they met in uh, Zimmerwald at uh, one time and other places and, and powerfully resisted the war. It led to Lenin's book called Imperialism. And uh, I was struck when I decided to do a little deeper plunge into imperialism, I thought I knew it, by checking the uh, notebooks on imperialism. Lenin had extensive notebooks that he wrote in preparation for the book. If you look at it, you call it often a pamphlet because it's a short book, but you look at it, you see no footnotes and you think, well, this is something that Lenin often did put together for polemical purposes. But the amount of research that he did and his notes is just stunning, just stunning in terms of how he worked. And I don't want to, I don't want to go over the whole whole book with you, but I do want to highlight um, seven points. These are these are points that I think are definitive of Lenin's book. They're they're his contribution. Uh, they're what he thinks is remarkable and what's scientific about his study of imperialism. First, unlike other people at the time, he was convinced, and he's convinced and he argues that imperialism is based on economic interest and motives. At that time, people saw the shooting in Sarajevo as maybe just an accident in history, an unfortunate happening, which was a spark or a uh, fuse for the rest of the war. They saw uh, imperialism as part of manifest destiny in the case of the US, religious conversion in the case of Belgium and, and Britain, in some cases, civilizing duty, et cetera, et cetera. So he shared with John Hobson the notion that imperialism is based upon economic interest and motives. Two, imperialism is a product of capitalism and capitalism generates imperialism. This is where he differs with Hobson and most of the other people writing at the time. It's a feature of capitalism. And invariably, almost invariably, capitalism as a system in its mature form generates imperialism. That's the basis for it. Three, capitalist competition in the era of imperialism almost inevitably leads to imperialist war. So you have the, the connection, economic interests under capitalism leading to war. On top of that, he wanted to separate himself from some other left thinkers. For example, Rudolf Hilferding argued that imperialism was a policy choice, that people chose imperialism and they could just as easily not choose imperialism. So in the political realm, you could fight to, to stop. You could imagine a capitalism without imperialism. Lenin rejects that idea. Most importantly, his rival at that time, and certainly most prominent person in, in, in Marxist, uh, the Marxist movement from the death of Engels until this time was Karl Kotsky. And Karl Kotsky had introduced a theory of ultra imperialism. That theory in its essence was that as the world was divided up between the powers, the great capitalist powers, as the world was divided up, they would be in agreement or a kind of equilibrium or stasis that would be achieved between all these capitalist countries. And imperialism would then exist as a stable system without war, without any, any uh, well, there'd be frictions of course, but nothing, uh, nothing major. That he totally rejected. And that's one of the main purposes of the book, Imperialism. 
In addition, and this is quite important, though not, not the only important thing, is he indicated there were five features that define imperialism. And I repeat, define, define imperialism, the system. We're dealing with a system and explain its genesis. A, a concentration of capital and production tending towards monopoly and cartelization. That's self explanatory. Competitive capitalism had reached a point where more and more big fish were eating up little fish, and there was more and more concentration of capital. It's important to know that in Leninism and all the Marxist writers of the era, unlike perhaps monopoly capitalism, the Sweezy and, and, uh, and Baran book gives the impression that competition still exists, still continues. B, the merging of bank capital and industrial capital. Well, that's the case because you don't have the small family-owned firms or the large family-owned firms. You have joint stock companies and you have investment of bank capital in industrial capital and vice versa. C, the export of capital. And this is very important. The huge accumulation of capital that occurs under monopoly capital. We call it monopoly capital, but it is the process of a concentration of capital and production. That concentration, that accumulation of capital finds new places to go. And that's what imperialism does. It takes it to new places. And E, finally, and this is important, though certainly not the most important, the territorial division of the world between the greatest capitalist powers. And it's important to note in the book, this comes after the chapter on the division of the world by the great powers. It is not a um, definition of of national imperialism, of the nation state as an imperialist power. It is not that. Unfortunately, a number of people have taken that to be the case. And in a recent, a recent year or so, that's been often offered as a justification for Russian exceptionalism in this, this current uh, war. Uh, let's take a short look at what he meant in the chapter on the division of the world and the big capitalist powers. The examples it give are, gives are Great Britain, France, Germany, Russia, USA, and Japan. So you see in, in that short span between when uh, Hobson was writing and, and 1916, when he was writing, 1915, uh, Japan and the US have joined that, that uh, elect group of uh, capitalist, giant capitalist powers, big capitalist powers. So, and he, and he notes very carefully that Russia is not a powerful capitalist country. It's an emerging capitalist country with one foot in feudalism. And he is explicit about that. It does not hold those five conditions for imperialism as a system up against Russia. That's not part of, of the book. He talks about small capitalist powers. That would be Belgium, though it had a huge colony in, in, in the Congo and Holland. And he talks about the colonies, of course. But the interesting thing that he also mentions is what he calls semi-colonies. These he calls transitional. And he cites Persia, China, and Turkey. And he, he adds Argentina, and I think he would add Portugal as well, because they are countries that have this, they have colonial interests of their own. They have imperial interests of their own. And they, in that, in that era, they actually uh, colonized countries. But they had so much capital from the giant capitalist countries, from the big capitalist powers, that they had this kind of uh, transitional semi-colonial status. And if we think about it, I think we'll see the beginnings of what later became what we call um, neo-colonialism after the, most of the colonial uh, dependents were found their independence. So that's essentially, that's my take, and that's what I'll stand by in terms of my interpretation of that book. Uh, uh, I would just add that Kautsky's ultra-imperialism is going to appear again and again and again in the next uh, 100 years. It doesn't go away. It's revived. Uh, uh, radicals who are anti-Leninist bring that up again and again. After the war ended, there's a new of course, a new situation, and that is the, the rising of the Soviet Union, a powerful new country that is outside of, outside of this imperialist uh, nexus. So what, what happened to imperialism? Well, it's still there. There's still rivalries between capitalist states. That continues. You see it in the 
in Japan, a newly emerging uh, Asian uh, capitalist power, which sets out in the 20s and 30s to conquer all of Asia and set up a, its own empire um, uh, around Asian nationalism. We see it in Italy, which uh, went after its reunification uh, and its involvement, engagement with capitalism after World War I, giving its strength with Mussolini, it engages in a long uh, aggression against European and African powers, and of course, Germany. So the rivalries still exist. They don't go away just because now the Soviet Union becomes the arch enemy of all the great capitalist powers. They unify around that. And one of the reasons they did it, of course, is because um, uh, the Soviet Union became the center, the ideological and practical center of anti-imperialism in the world. And along with that was Lenin's development of uh, a theory of the rights of self-determination. I want to read you what I think is the best summary, it's in Lenin's words, of that right of self-determination. And it's something to think about when we discuss Ukraine. Complete equality of rights for all nations. The right of nations to self-determination. The unity of the workers of all nations. Such is the national program that Marxism, the experience of the whole world, and experience of Russia teach the workers. So what's added to this on top of the Western notion, if you will, of self-determination is the unity of the workers of all nations. And for Marxists, I think that's something we should definitely heed. Now, obviously we're approaching World War II and these rivalries continue and they reach a boiling point. Uh, I don't have to revisit that history. I know everyone on this, on this call is familiar with it. I, I, there's an issue that arises today. It's a hot button issue. I'll, I'll mention it, but I'm not gonna talk about it. it. Takes us a bit of field, but it may wanna come up in the discussion. And that is, is World War II an anti-fascist war as depict, depicted by the popular front communists at the time and leftists at that time, or is it an inter-imperialist war as depicted by some contemporary communists? Or is there some synthesis of those two views? So I'll throw that out like red meat and see if people want to pick up on it in the discussion. Let's go to the end of World War II. Now we have a new situation. We have the, uh, the beginning of the end of colonialism. That is the independence of African and Asian states is happening rapidly. And much of that I would lay at the doorstep. I would, I would praise deeply the role of the Soviet Union and, and the Eastern European uh, 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 socialist countries and their rise at the time and the rise of anti-fascism which built these communist parties up in various places. So we see the decline then of, of, of colonialism in the way that we talked about it earlier on. But as it turns out, the um, roots of that exploitation remain. And in fact, it's a cheapening for the capitalist powers. It's a whole lot cheaper to economically dominate countries that are nominally independent and not pay for a military to hold them in, in a, a constraint not pay for their infrastructures. The cost of colonialism are not born anymore, but still retain that domination. And uh, it, Marxist, uh, one of the leading uh, proponents, uh, developers of this theory of neo-colonialism was Kwame Nkrumah. And it became pretty much the, the thinking of the Marxist movement that we're then in a period of, it, it preserves Leninism, the, the core of Leninism, but it discounts the fact that colonies have to be central to that, but the domination is still there. And of course, at the same time with the liberation of these countries nominally, like the Congo from Belgium, came a new form of bogus anti-imperialism. One of the early versions of it was in Katanga, where the uh, capitalist countries decided they were going to support the self-determination of Katanga, which was a rich, a wealthy province in Congo from the newly established Congo. So we begin to see the use of imperialism uh, with this concept of self-determination uh, against progressive forces. And it underscores the need to learn the difference between popular self-determination and artificial self-determination. 
Now in the 60s and in the 70s, Leninism was uh, quite popular. I mean, there was a, you know, the communist movement was very strong, um, but there were developments, there were um, rivals, rival approaches to, um, to Leninism, to Lenin's theory of imperialism and its, and its development. I call it third worldism because largely it grew out of two factors. One is the growth of a non-aligned movement and two, the lack of a revolutionary movement among workers in the Western European countries and the United States and so on. So people frustrated with that developed world systems theory, dependency theory, a, a seed of that theory in this country was monthly review in the, uh, in Africa and in Europe, some era men was associated with it. And the key ideas were that the world is really divided between core and periphery. And that the source of poverty of the periphery being impoverished and the core being enriched was unequal exchanged. And this was a non-Marxist notion. This is a notion that basically it was countries confronting countries. So the West as countries were taking advantage of their their, uh, uh, their economic power against countries that had did not have those economic powers and it often took the form of raw material sources versus manufactured goods and an equal exchange between them. Uh, sad to say, the highest development of this uh, dependency theory was the uh, two superpower theory by uh, leaders of the People's Republic of China at the time. Uh, it led to Unfortunately, to uh, collaboration with, with uh, capitalist powers in the West, for example, in Africa, where, um, well, in other places as well, but where the, the, bogus, uh, the bogus liberation movements, FNLA and uh, UNITA and Angola, uh, their counterparts in Mozambique and in Guinea-Bissau and other countries were supported by not only the capitalist countries, but by the People's Republic of China. I, uh, that's a piece of history that, that is unfortunate and I, I can't speak to whether it's ever been, how do I say, uh, uh, condemned by uh, People's China or not or whether foreign policy went afterwards, but it is a, 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 an unfortunate uh, time at the time. But it, that was where this, this third worldism took people away from Leninism. And it rises up again in the 21st century uh, in a very sophisticated and interesting book by John Smith called Imperialism in the 21st Century, which uh, at its core argues that the world's divided between oppressor and oppressor, oppressor and oppressed peoples. And while he brings the working class back into it because it was published in 2016 and, and the Asian countries were powerhouses the, uh, uh, with huge working classes, it still retains a a kind of non-Marxist concept of super exploitation. So these were rivals. Uh, the, the third worldism has pretty much disappeared with the rise of the other challenge to Leninism, which came after the demise of the Soviet Union. And that was the theories associated around globalization, the theory of the dissolution of the nation state as an agent of imperialism. It reached its, uh, its popularity with a book called Empire, which had the misfortune of coming out in 2000, the year before the US went on a, a war, a national, uh, a national rampage of war and aggression against the rest of the world. And it was a return to Kotsky's ultra imperialism. And it argued that these post war institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the G7, G20, G17, G whatever, OECD, et cetera, all these acronyms were tying together imperialism in such a way that it was a return to peace, a return to stability, and, uh, and the battles for progress had to be fought in different places, in different areas. And essentially, it kind of blew up and you don't hear much about it anymore uh, because of its unfortunate timing. But I remember I wrote a paper for Science and Society and I, I gathered up a couple of reputable scholarly types that I thought they would, they would be impressed with. But it was a moment where they were terribly impressed with the idea that the nation state was declining. And I was arguing for classical Leninism and they rejected it. So my loss, maybe it's their loss. I like to think it's their loss. Um, I wrote an article in 2015 
on the new imperialism. It's a very long piece. You're welcome to read it. There are things in there I regret, but I won't tell you what they were. You have to find out for yourself if you're interested. But I want to quote from some of the things that I, I wrote at the time, which I think are timely. The US has promoted or prodded Eastern European nationalism to share away countries that were formally accepted as part of the Russian sphere of influence. Not surprisingly, Russia has interpreted these moves as hostile acts and taken countermeasures. The Ukrainian crisis, this is in 2015, immediately after the 2014 uh, coup, uh, has produced belligerence unseen since the Cold War. At the same time, the EU, and this is, this is an important part, at the same time, the EU opposes escalating anti-Russian primitive punitive sanctions urged by the US, sensing the danger of disrupted economic relations and even war at a time when the European community is already suffering severe economic pain. So I wrote this in 2015 and I was wrong. But, but why I was wrong was because it was a different Europe then than it is today. Uh, you can't imagine Merkel, who was uh, the nominal leader of Europe at that time, accepting the US imposing a war against Russia at that time. It's only in these last some years that that's become acceptable in Europe. And that's been an essential part of it, an intimidation uh, through the use of sanctions and other things. About BRICS, I wrote, they are not opposed to the predation inherent in international economic competition. They're only opposed to US dominance of that predation. Uh, I stand by that. I know a lot of people will disagree with me. I close that article with, yet what otherwise exists today strongly resembles the imperialism of Lenin's time. The imperialism of economically vulturous nations and fettered by a counterforce like the Soviet Union. Perhaps the new, in quotes, imperialism is little more than a return to the imperialism that opened the last century with the US replacing Great Britain as a dominant imperial power. The quote, new is simply the reassertion of the old. Understanding today's imperialism requires some ideological retooling. The days of an alliance of socialist countries and a newly liberated colony searching for new roads under the socialist umbrella are past. In its stead are capitalist countries competing against the more dominating capitalist countries. Should they succeed in deposing the US, they in turn will fight to retain hegemony. That is, they will behave like a capitalist country. So in 2015, I'm suggesting that should they succeed in deposing the US as the centerpiece of global imperialism, they in turn will fight to retain hegemony. That's the nature of imperialism as I understand it and I think as Lenin understood it. That is, they will behave like a capitalist country. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I am going to return to the theme of Ukraine, which I wrote about. And uh, I'm going to quickly discuss the biggest part of the left. Uh, I'll call it the shameful left, the opportunist left. And that's the center left folks that are siding with the United States and NATO and stand behind this bogus self-determination for Ukraine. Um, I think many of the people on this call, on this conference, this Zoom conference, will agree with me, so won't, but I would liken it to the US installation of a puppet government in South Vietnam. I mean, it's, it has the same logic uh, to it. It's um, Ukraine since it was a socialist republic, since 1991 when it stopped being a socialist republic, a Soviet socialist republic, has been a country of great poverty, a country of enormous corruption, of political thievery, there has been no stable government. There's been no progressive government. Um, it's been essentially a disaster, but it's been successive governments looking for sponsors. In the case of uh, the pro-Russian leaders, they were looking for a sponsor and they found it in Russia. They thought they found a Russia, they were banking on that. In the case of the pro-NATO people, they were banking on the West but they were all opportunist in that sense. And so to call this, to call this, um, to call this 
war, a war of self-determination by the Ukrainian people. And the US is a compliant supporter of that. It's just sheer nonsense. And I, I someone earlier mentioned Consortium News, a recent article. There's a piece by Charles Pierce on Consortium News in which he outlines uh, explicitly, explicitly the the players and uh, maybe too explicitly the players in this this left, this phony left of ours, the majority of which associated with the Democratic Party are supporting this war, are simply supporting this war. Um, now right against it, and I identify them as comrades and friends, though they don't often agree with me, they always agree with me, are the folks that, that uh, are well aware of the machinations of NATO and the US in focusing this war, and in fact, I would argue that they trapped Russia into this war in the way that Zabrinsky trapped the Soviet Union into Afghanistan. That's speculation on my part. But what I do deny is that the, the view that there's a Russian exceptionalism, that Russia's role in this war is somehow a liberating or an anti-imperialist role. I don't see that at all. I don't accept that at all. Uh, and it's, it's often, organized around this notion of multipolarity. You can only get rid of the United States as this pillar of imperialism, leader of imperialism, if you will, then everything would be peaceful and stable. It's just a return of Kautsky. And it's just as naive as Kautsky was. That's not the way imperialism operates. And I understand, I, I share some of the Soviet nostalgia. I'd like to believe that Russia will have a revolution and go back to the Soviet Union. I'd like to believe that it might happen in Ukraine. But I'm more inclined to agree with, with Lenin. And I think a lot of folks don't want to hear this, but Lenin was a great supporter of ending the war in 18, the 1914 uh, First World War. I mean, the pillage and the death and the destruction were so horrible. And like all people, uh, himself and the other people in the Zimmerwald group, they opposed this uh, to the tips of their toes. But he wrote the following, a mass sentiment for peace often expresses the beginning of a protest, an indignation, and a consciousness of the reactionary nature of the war. It is the duty of all social democrats to take advantage of this sentiment. They will take the most ardent part in every movement and in every demonstration made on this basis, something we're not doing today. I, mean, I think Code Pink is, but few of us are. But they will not deceive the people by assuming then the absence of a revolutionary movement it is possible to have peace without annexations, without oppression of nations, without robbery, without planting the seeds of new wars among the present governments and the ruling classes. Such deception would only play into the hands of the secret diplomacy of the belligerent countries and their counter-revolutionary plans. Whoever wishes a durable and democratic peace must be for civil war against the governments and the bourgeoisie. It's a pamphlet that Lenin and Zenofia wrote, Socialism and War. Now, so what I'm essentially saying is that we need a peace movement. That's the message that I really have tried to stand by in the seven articles I've written. That's the most important thing. We need to be for peace and we need to, uh, uh, ending of hostilities. Uh, I'm happy to see that uh, a People's China came out last week and called for that. Uh, even Modi's India called for that. Friends of, of Russia are calling for that. Um, Obviously, there was an attempt in March to, to create such a peace, and it was Boris Johnson, uh, speaking for the United States and the other capitalist countries, that put a kibosh to it. But we have to insist that that happen. I mean, that has to be first on our agenda. Now, let me throw some red meat out there. These are, these are some conclusions I drew in my articles. I'll go through them fairly quickly. Um, so it's clear where I stand. Number one, 21st century imperialism shares more features with the imperialism of Lenin's time than any differences. Imperialism constitutes a system of global competition for resources, markets, and labor power, pits capitalist countries against one another to establish spheres of interest and a better field of operation for its monopolies. The struggle instigated by the U.S. for dominance of Ukraine involves monopolies in the energy sector and the weapons industry, as well as an attempt to secure and expand existing spheres of influence, of interest. 
While the U.S. is the more powerful great power and the instigator, Russia is an aspiring great power drawn into invading a transitional country, Ukraine. With successive corrupt governments, Ukraine has since independence longed to be a protectorate of a great power, whoever offers the best bargain. At stake are the interests of the various ruling classes. I'm going to take a swig here so I can get through this. The argument popular among Western leftists over whether Russia is an imperialist country or an anti-imperialist country opposes US and, e and opposing US and EU imperialism is a sterile scholastic debate. From a Leninist perspective, today's Russia, like Tsarist Russia, is a nation capitalist country vying for a position as a leading force in the scramble for markets and spheres of interest. Russia's engagement in defiance of US imperialism in Syria, Cuba, Venezuela, et cetera, is just that, defiance of a rival. The powerful rivals are aggressively threatening Russia's ambitions, is notable, but of little bearing on the interest of the Russian, Ukrainian, US, or EU working classes. Also, I'll just add today, I, I had a chance to read Putin's speech um, on the acceptance of the uh, annexation of the four new uh, republics. I urge you to take a look at that. It's filled basically with nostalgia for the old Russia, which uh, is quite interesting. Four, in fact, the Ukraine war's progress, unquote, has, as, as a Leninist perspective would predict, dramatically and negatively affected the fate of workers globally. Millions of lives have been disrupted, harmed, or ended. Five, the demise of the Soviet Union At a free, has freed the hand of imperialism, producing a world substantially congruent with early 20th century imperialism. Some of the players have changed or assumed different roles, but the logic of great power imperialism remains intact. Though those of us who defend the historical role of the Soviet Union must dispel any remaining romantic attachment to today's Russia. It participates in the global system of imperialism as a great power. Six. As Lenin warns, the attempt to separate imperialism from its capital's roots destines anti-imperialism to ineffectuality. Petty bourgeois reformism, moralistic anti-imperialism, what Lenin calls the last of the Mohicans of bourgeois democracy, collapses into pacifism, a posture good for the soul, but impotent against the schemes of the great powers. Today's leftist celebration of the projected multipolar capitalist world is a further attempt to separate great power rivalries from their roots in capitalist, specifically monopoly capitalist interest. Multipolarity was a feature of imperialism in the prelude to World War I. In fact, the attempt to impose multi multipolarity upon a world saddled with uh, British, uh, the domination of the British empire was a critical factor leading to World War I. The retreat from Leninism is essentially a retreat from socialism, desperate, unfounded faith in A, the efficacy of multipolarity, and B, the hope of finding a principal anti-imperialist rallying point around an eviscerated, ravaged form of socialist state now owned by mega billionaires, and C, the miraculous transformation of the existing money-driven elite-led Western bourgeois parties, and, and D, the belief that the splintered, self-absorbed, multi-interest, multi-identity left can magically coalesce into a force for radical change. They are all products of a loss of confidence in the socialist project. Lessons of history and history's most brilliant teachers are the best guides for the future we want. And that's my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, and um, very good pre presentation. Um, I know that you started mm -hmm. off by raising the issue of the failure of a peace movement to arise. And you um, also addressed that toward the end and hopefully we can get that into the Q and A. Um, but before we do that, I would like to stop for some announcements. So Jean, if you could take that over and um, tell us what uh, to expect in the next coming weeks. Oh, okay. Well, 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 thank you. And, and thanks so much, Greg. This was, as anticipated, a very thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, discussion 
on this issue. But we have continuing uh, discussion on uh, very important issues. Um, next week, October 9th, we have um, We the Elites, Why the U.S. Constitution Serves the Few. And I think we all know this in our bones, but uh, we do, it's worthwhile. Uh, Robert Arvetz uh, uh, will be our speaker. Following that, uh, our very own um, Al Sargis will be here in what we hope will be a Zoom and a, a joint hybrid meeting with Zoom and at the Marxist Library on August Willich, the first and last communist US general, which uh, as always, Al will be very thought provoking on that issue. And then finally, we have uh, again, our very own Raj Sahai, who is going to be talking about the challenge of Alexander Dugan, which we've all read about in the news and uh, the fourth political theory. <clears throat> so uh, all of this will be very provocative uh, and um, stick with us. And if you have more information, check our website and I'll turn it over back to you, Roger, and to um, uh, uh, Rich, Richard, John uh, Fallenbaum. Okay, th th thank, you, thank you very much. And Richard put in the chat um, a um, link to uh, contributing to help help the freight expenses of the uh, ICSS, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society, which is the group that has brought these programs to you for the last uh, decade and a half. And now we'll go into the Q&A. Uh, usually in the Q&A, what we do is we ask folks to limit themselves to two minutes to either make a statement or make a question and then give the speaker the opportunity to respond. And so I see um, Norma, Norma Harrison's hand up, followed by Raj Sahai. So Norma, you have the floor. So thank you, of course. I've been looking forward to this presentation and it's been for good reason. What has been evident almost since the amassing of ex-Soviet forces at the borders has been that Ukraine needs preemptively, needed preemptively to surrender and, cre and create and accede to the terms that it will stop allowing and aiding US hegemony to continue the 110 year old attacks on the Bolshevik revolution that so scares our owners and rightly so as communism seeps in throughout the world. Now, I am not saying that there is still a Bolshevik revolution. I'm not saying that Putin is a supporter of a uh, return of the USSR, he might be. He he uh, deplored the loss of the Soviet of the Soviet Union. He he spoke loudly, saying that the uh, the worst thing that happened in the time was the loss of the Soviet Union. And I've, it's been about thirty years since he said that, or twenty years, something like that. Uh, but I am saying that. Ukraine has been properly charged. Russia did not uh, assail back to Ukraine for no good reason, as has been told over and over again by US mass media and uh, the purchased legislators that owe everything to the uh, people that buy them. Thank you. Um, Greg, do you want to comment or? Well, I, 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 our media, and I, I should, should have mentioned it, has, has been nothing but cheerleaders for uh, NATO and the US. And so I totally agree with that comment. I think that's, that needs to be said. I would uh, differ. I, don't, I think uh, Putin is pretty clear that he's no fan of the Soviet Union. That, that quote's an old quote. But in, even in the speech that I referred to, the speech that he gave a few days ago, it's, it's, his, his uh, allegiances are to czarist Russia, and he makes it explicit. Uh, there's a passing uh, reference to the Great Patriotic War, which of course is appreciated, but uh, Russia is not the Soviet Union, and it's hard for many of us to let go of that notion. He's very angry, 
and rightfully excuse me, so. Excuse me. No, excuse me. I have the rest of this comment to make. Um, let's go on to the next speaker, um, which is Raj Sahai. I'm, I'm Unmute yourself, yeah. Raj. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So I um, I agree with you that it is uh, a rival block of imperialism is forming, you know, uh, and, in, and in the age of imperialism, uh, I don't think there can be a unipolar imperialist block for long. But here's why Lenin also said, look at things in a very concrete uh, concrete way. I mean, uh, take all uh, concrete facts and analyze them concretely. Um, so partly, I, I think you and I will agree, but here I want to present to you the situation. In 1970, West Pakistan, Pakistan was split in two parts, East and West. It, uh, its ruling class denied that Bengalis, which were in the language of the East Pakistanis, use of their own language in official matters. And when their leader, Mujib, who was elected uh, with a great majority, sought autonomy within Pakistan to protect that right, West Pakistani ruling elite sent army to East Pakistan and took him prisoner and launched a program of Hindu minority and against Mujib's followers. So 13 million of them fled to India. India prepared to attack Pakistani army in East Pakistan. Nixon was furious. Pakistan was an ally, anti-communist ally. Nixon was sent to Delhi to tell Mrs. Gandhi not to attack. Mrs. Gandhi defied Nixon. Nixon sent the US Sixth Fleet into the Bay of Bengal to scare India. In response, the USSR sent an even larger naval armada into the Bay of Bengal and told Mrs. Gandhi to proceed. Well, the war took place, Indian Army in 71 on a special military operation in East Pakistan, defeated Pakistan, took 100,000 soldiers as prisoners and East Pakistan became an independent country, Bangladesh. India was not a socialist country then, but a capitalist country. Was India then playing capitalist conquering role for resources of Bangladesh? No, the history says nothing of the sort. So why charge Russia with that using Lenin's thesis when concretely the fact is that Russian I think minority was under siege by Kiev's forces ever since they declared independence, which Putin did not for eight years did not recognize and try to work out an agreement of Minsk one and two, which Kiev, uh, uh, basically used to build up their forces and defied and basically uh, did not follow. So I see this as, as that situation where I think minority of Russia in the Donbass are, are basically broken away after the USSR broke and Putin uh, is under pressure by his own population as Mrs. Gandhi was when pogroms against Hindus took place. So uh, yes, they're both capitalist countries, but I see the US, and I think here you agree, has been putting pressure on Russia with a view, I believe, to weaken it, which is their stated policy. And Russia is in a defensive mode. And in this case, the provocation was from the United States. And so why don't we see it that way rather than a, a everybody acting under Lenin's imperialist thesis on every matter that ever becomes a conflict. That's thank my you. question to you. Thank, thank you, Raj. And let me announce the, the, the stack before I ask Greg to respond. Um, so um, this is roughly in the order that I, I actually saw the hands. I, I'm not sure that's the exact same order of people raised their hands, but the um, stack afterward would be Jean, Alan Grover Fur and Lewis and Peter Fry. So, um, Greg, could you could you respond to Roger's query? Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, look, uh, we're Marxists. I mean, I'm arguing as a Marxist. I'm saying the role of a Marxist is to stop this war. Uh, it, it can't be undone. 
And my target are those people who believe in Russian exceptionalism. That is those people that think the Russian mission here is something more than, than it is. Uh, that it supersedes the, the, our interest in seeing the war end and the bloodshed end and the destruction end. And I don't think it does. I think our role and our principal um, aim should be to end the war, stop the war as quickly and effectively as we can. Uh, I'm targeting the left that's standing on the sidelines and uh, hoping or thinking that somehow Russia's role is liberating, therefore let's let it continue and let's let the Donbass and Luhansk be liberated, but we're not gonna be part of an anti-war movement. That's my target. I think I'd, lo I'd love to see everybody agree that we should be out on September 10th, we are out again in Pittsburgh on the streets with our sign, stop the war. I would hope that everybody would leave this with the same purpose. Thank you, thank you. Um, Jean? Yeah, yes, th thank you so much, uh, Greg. A and, uh, you know, I, I really agree with at least 90% of, of your talk, but uh, as is the want around this place, I will concentrate on the 10% uh, area of disagreement. Um, and, and that can be summed up in one word, China, uh, which you did not touch upon, but which I think is a key area of the international class struggle at the present time. And I would simply point out that I know there are many people probably present today who regard China as an imperialist country. And I think that's a dangerously misleading um, conception because uh, China is a different kind of animal. After the throw, overthrow of the Soviet Union, China took appropriate action against the counter-revolutionaries at Tiananmen Square and uh, entered a new phase of the class struggle, which can be called uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And that, is not, and that is a new phenomenon, which I think needs to be understood as such. And uh, again, unlike the old imperialism uh, of, um, or the, you know, our U.S. imperialism, which is the real, real imperialism at the present time, and I certainly agree, all moves that are, and our, my organization, the Vets for Peace, uh, uh, has uh, come out uh, in support of the peace, of the demonstrations on that. But, um, you know, China has uh, taken on this new role. It is not imperialist. It is true that it is making investments around the world, but these are of a fundamentally different kind. They're not for the extraction of resources, but they're primarily in what uh, the Chinese, and I think it's properly called a win-win kind of relationship. And they're, they're expanding, uh, I think over 20 countries in Latin America uh, have uh, uh, signed on to the Bel Belt and Road. And they've done this voluntarily. That doesn't mean they're turning over uh, their resources, but they are being utilized for the benefit of all humanity. So I, I see China as the leading force in the world revolution at the present time. And I know there may actually be some who disagree with me on that point, but uh, I, I just okay, want to write you know, your opinion on you're, that. It's a little, little bit over getting on three minutes, so thank you. Um, Greg, if you could. I, I really appreciate the 90%. I think that's a victory. 90% of what, what I said, but uh, I, I did not talk about China. I purposely didn't talk about China. I, I catch it from all sides because I'm a fence with China. I, I wrote a piece 10 years ago called Wither China. And I stole that title from R. Paul McDutt, a famous uh, uh, British Indian communist who uh, I have hold in high regard who had a similar pamphlet. He wrote it in the 70s and he posed the question, whether China? He did not demonize China and say, well, it's not a socialist ruler anymore. He did not elevate China and say, oh, it's the, the socialist model. He asked the question, where is it going? 
And I continue to ask that question. I don't think anyone, I, and I, I do that with regard to imperialism. I don't think we should talk about an imperialist country. I don't think we should talk about a, uh, a socialist country, simply. Uh, Why I see China simply is it has capitalist elements, which I think people find it hard to deny. It has banks which are nominally publicly owned that are enormous and big, helped it get through the 07 through 09 crisis. And it has a policy which is a different policy with this Belt and Road. How different it is and where it goes, I don't know. The positive side that I, I generally see in China in the last period is largely due or could largely be due by the simple fact that it's, it's reaching out to the West in terms of markets and in terms of collaboration and cooperation have been rebuffed. And so it's responding to that. I could be wrong. So that 10%, I guess we probably still don't agree, but don't mistake me. I'm, I'm not a, I'm, 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 I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. Thank okay. you so much. And, and, th and thank you, Greg. Okay, so um, next in the stack uh, is Alan, followed by Grover Fur followed by Ann Lewis, followed by Peter Fra Fay, Mark Albertson, and then Richard Wright, if I got everybody correctly in line. So Alan, if you could ask your question, please. Sure, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Greg, a couple of things. First of all, uh, thank you for presenting. I really appreciated your last article and your presentation where you went into the history of uh, Lenin's theory and a lot of uh, the history from the uh, late 19th, early 20th century on imperialism. Um, I also have to say that I agree with you on this idea of multipolarity as sort of a strategic road uh, to liberation for the working class and oppressed people in the world. Um, I'm in favor of unipolarity for the working class. Uh, and I think that that's really what we're, we're aiming for. And I think we all agree with that. Where I think I disagree with you is on two points. Number one, I want to go back to, to what Raj brought up earlier in his comment, which is if you look at the concrete history of what took place, what has taken place in Ukraine, uh, the fact that the, um, the Russians spent eight years trying to negotiate a solution that uh, involved not uh, annexation, but autonomy. And we're repeatedly confronted by uh, aggressive posture and actions on the part of NATO, that this picture really doesn't uh, correspond to the idea of imperialist conquest on the part of Russia uh, in the war against um, uh, Ukraine. I think Raj brought up a very interesting point, which is that there's an aspect of the national question here, where the Russians were um, the Russians uh, were legitimately uh, defending not only the the against the attacks on the ethnic uh, Russian uh, areas in eastern Ukraine, but also the true aim of the NATO war which is to weaken and break up Russia as a force in the area. So in that sense, I think that it's, an, to me, that says something that, that why we have, we have to support them in this defensive action. The second thing, and I'll wrap this up very quickly, is if you look at how the world has lined up on this conflict, we have Cuba, Iran, Venezuela, Nicaragua, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, all the African countries, they're not looking at this and saying, well, this is just a, uh, an infighting between two capitalist countries that are doing land grabbing. There's something to the fact that these countries recognize that there's something in their interest, the interests of their people, and I would say the interests of the working class that aligns with what Russia is doing. And in fact, if you look at it today, what is it that is the is really causing the the degeneration of the imperialist bloc that has dominated since World War II? Today we have the dollar under threat. We have stresses being placed on the Western um, 
uh, alliance, the NATO alliance. We have the ability, uh, the sanctions regime is being undermined by uh, in response to what, what the Russians are doing. I think if the Russians lose here, this is gonna be a, a tremendous uh, defeat for the working class and oppressed people of the world. And it's gonna set things back for a generation. On the other hand, what we're, what we're not seeing is the uh, immediate road to socialism, but we are seeing something in a short-term tactical sense that is important for us to recognize and support. That's all I have to say. Th th thank you, and I have to apologize that I haven't been a very good timekeeper. I, I usually rely on Alan to keep time, but I'm the timekeeper. But I took I took as much time as I wanted. So. <laughs> but, but it was a good question. So, Greg, please please respond. Yeah, uh, regarding the length of time that Russia has invested in trying to get a settlement, I should remind everyone that the Soviet Union began warning the world about uh, fascism and trying to create mutual non-aggression pacts from uh, the beginning, I mean, since from the 20s uh, until they, they finally uh, did the uh, Ribbentrop, Ribbentrop, Ribbentrop uh, Dimitrov Pact uh, in 1939. So it isn't a matter of how much time you devote to trying to work the problem out, it really isn't. Uh, I, I think when you look at where things are today after that invasion eight months later, it's hard to find any tactical, practical reason why Russia would have invaded. It really underestimated the response entirely. And that's damaging. And that's why I think the Chinese, People's China, others are coming out now and calling for a cessation of, uh, of, uh, of violence. Of, of war. Uh, I, I think we should separate anti-US imperialism from anti-imperialism. It's, it's a mistake I've made in the past of not doing. If we separate the two and we understand the roots of imperialism in general are in capitalism, that we ought to be directing our attention on capitalism. That should be what we on the left, our left, certainly our Marxist left, but our Marxist and friends of Marx, our socialist left, should be attacking, and that is imperialism, not just U.S. imperialism. Of course, it doesn't preclude being anti-U.S. imperialism. We've led. All of us, I'm sure, have played a role in leading against U.S. imperialism, but we should not, for even a moment, believe that's the same as being anti-imperialist. That's a different matter, and that's what I think reflecting on Lenin reminds us and brings us back to. Okay, thank you. Um, Grover is next, followed by Anne, Peter, Mark, Richard, Stephanie, and Nina. Grover, please. Uh, Greg, thank you very much. Uh, unless, unless your remarks have been uh, a summary of, uh, of the other articles on your blog, uh, I hope you write them up as we've heard them today. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Number one, uh, it seems to me that one can make a good argument that uh, the United States, being the leadership of NATO, uh, provoked this war and in a certain sense uh, desired war as an outcome of its policies, uh, certainly since 2014, if not before. What do you think of that uh, position, uh, driving Russia into a corner to the, to the point whereby it had, uh, Putin had little, little, uh, little alternative to attack? What do you think of that? The second thing is, um, along with what John Mearsheimer, University of Chicago political scientist, thinks, he asks, uh, why hasn't the United States focused on China? Why is it uh, focusing so strongly on, uh, on uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine and on NATO uh, and essentially driving Russia into the arms of China? What do you think of that uh, question? That's it. Uh, thanks, Grover. Those are good questions. Uh, the the uh, question number one, yes, they were provoked. Absolutely, they were provoked. I wrote about it. I see it as a reinstantiation of the uh, Brezhnev, uh, not Brezhnev, the Brzezinski trap, so-called trap, in which the Soviet Union was kind of lured into uh, and invited, but invited to go into Afghanistan. And uh, you would expect 
If you compare Putin to Soviet leadership and all the baiting and provoking that was done towards the Soviet leadership in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and so on, he doesn't show the same kind of, uh, of uh, judgment that they showed. So yes, they were provoked, but I don't think it justifies an invasion. On two, look, we, we need as Marxists to, to, to uh, ferret out the economic reasons why the U.S. has provoked, why it's engaged uh, at this particular moment. And it has to do with the development of the fracking industry in the United States, which is a newfound development where we're now net exporters of energy, when up until some years ago, we were big time importers. And we talked about, and we were in every other country trying to impose our will on Iraq and Iran and places that, uh, that had oil and had uh, natural gas. Now the shoe is on the other foot. We're going after countries like, well, countries, super countries like, like the EU, which depend upon Russian gas and Russian oil. And we're trying to take that away. And that's the source of this. You know, it's, maybe people will say that's reductionist or that's just economism or whatever. But it is. That's the motivation. That's what explains why the U.S. is pushing to start this war. Because you're pushed to start a war, and these are lessons that Soviet diplomacy will tell you again and again, there's no reason to start a war. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Glover. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Greg. So now we have on the stack uh, Peter, Mark, Richard, Stefan, Nina, Sharon, and I'm going to put myself in the stack, followed by Charlie. And Janet, it looks like, is up on the stack. So we have a lot of good questions coming up. Um, Peter, um, you have the floor right now. Uh, I'd love to. I, I thought you were going to put Anne. Was, was Anne on your list? Um, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I. Thank you. <laughs> I, I missed. I missed Anne. She, and um, my my apologies. So if you, if you could hold, and Anne is next to me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Roger. I I, I mean I, I was feeling some relief actually because <laughs> I'm still thinking about what Greg said yet last about fracking, and I was thinking well, and agriculture as well, and kind of you know mulling that around. But thanks very much, Greg. Um, I think that the this call for peace um, is is right at the heart of this whole thing. Um, and, and so my question's kind of off off in another direction, um, which is, you know, what has happened to the peace movement in this in this country and in the world? Um, it seems to me we need to try to understand that. And within that, we need to understand the role of um, of working class the working class in that movement. Um, and as a union person, this is really important to me, um, but we're seeing total hegemony, I think, across the board, um, particularly in the US around this question. I see it as also a question of, of, a, of a very old split between the peace movement and the justice movement. Um, and that I think is being exaggerated somewhat with notions of nationalism, which in, in many ways are appropriate here um, within, the, within the African-American and to a certain extent, Latino movements. Um, I think that, you know, I think we're, we need to figure out a way to build a mass movement again, or to be part of that. Um, if it if it doesn't exist to build it, but I, I wanted to hear more of your thinking about that kind of question. Lenin was uh, clear as a bell on on the working class and war. In other words, what mobilizes the working class are wars. I mean, wars really impact working people more than anything. The toll on Europe this winter is going to be incredible, and we've already seen a rise in Prague. We've seen a rising in uh, Paris this past week, just shut Paris down essentially around the energy and indirectly around the war. And this is going to uh, develop. And this is why Lenin saw revolution as a product of anti-war activity, because eventually, as the ruling classes ignore 
the appeal for peace, the working class becomes more and more angry and more and more willing to take power away from them. So this is this is an opportunity we should we should really jump on to to reactivate the anti-war movement. It's kind of a and I didn't mean to pick on a U.S. peace movement or U.S. movement because you're right internationally it's weak. The anti-war movement is weak, but you can see it's beginning to emerge, and uh, I think that's what we we'd be remiss if we did not put that in the forefront of our work, peace work right now around this war. And it means we can attack NATO. We can call for NATO to be dissolved or defanged or what have you. We can call for the US out of uh, Ukraine politics. All those goals that people that perhaps disagree with me about Russian exceptionalism, the differences we have disappear around that. We can all work together to get NATO out of this too. So, but, but it seems to me that Russian exceptionalism as an approach has kept people on the sidelines and we have to rush in, except for Code Pink. I mean, I have to say all the credit in the world for Code Pink keeping the focus on what's really happening. And they, 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 they are appalled by war. They're appalled by destruction and death. It's not just a, uh, a, a game for them. So all, all, all power to Code Pink and we should all get in line and follow them. Thank you. And Peter, now it's your turn. I... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I got to say, I mean, I was expecting a lot more disagreement uh, in this discussion, but I, I really, you know, having read your article and, uh, uh, you know, hearing you talk, I think I do agree with, you know, vast majority of what you're saying. I don't think there's much disagreement here among the audience about imperialism, about Lenin's uh, definition and application, but uh, the, the 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 devil is in the details, like they say. Um, and I I question the I I question the the theory that because Russia is imperialist, which I don't know, I think I suppose most of us can agree with that that uh, it. It uh, has those ambitions and that, those possibilities, but no, all, not all imperialists are equal. Just because they are imperialists does not mean every country must be treated the same. And when when I when I read stuff, uh, read something like uh, the statement that uh, you know Russia is a monopoly capitalist regime with a leader who seeks to emulate Peter the Great and denies the principle of self-determination. Um, I, I can't really, I can't really uh, justify that having just read uh, his, you know, Putin's speech yesterday or two days ago, where he said, where he's denouncing imperialism, denouncing uh, and stating straight up that he has no, that he does not seek to, re Re, re, reconfigure or re, a return to either czarist or or Soviet, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Russia, and I, I think that it's um, it, it's a little bit. Uh, I, I guess I'm just I'm just trying to make sense of of you know this call to to everyone should be against war. Uh, well, that is our role to be against war to to, to uh, push the, the peace movement. Well, certainly that wasn't our role during World War II, was it? We, our role was to support the war during World War II. What is our, our role to support to end the war now that that the U.S. is on the verge of being defeated? And it is. The U.S. I, uh, U.S. has only a couple of few, only a few more months uh, before is completely defeated in in Ukraine. So. I think there is need. There really needs to be a part on a, a, a on the part of Marxists. Has to there needs to be a a a more nuanced understanding of world balance of forces of a nuclear power that we that we're going up against. It's not simply a uh, any a imperialist power. Okay, I'll, I'll end it. I just wanted to get that your kind of response on uh, you know. Uh, uh, as someone who doesn't doesn't agree that just that that Russia is a is 
an imperialist, uh, or is trying to resurrect, uh, you know, czarist Russia. Thank you. Greg, do you want to? Respond? Yeah, just, just. <laughs> I just want to defend myself. We, we, uh, uh, the quote about Peter the Great is not my quote. I, I know uh, Eugene had uh, an initial uh, blurb we were putting together. Together, um, he quoted, used that quote. And I said, "That's not me." I quote Andrew Murray, who says, "Peter the Great, Putin is Peter the Great." And Andrew okay, Murray, sorry. Uh, no, that's all right. That's quite all right. Uh, Andrew Murray is a leader, one of the principal leaders of the anti-war movement in England in the past, in the UK in the past. But I would just say that um, how the war proceeds, I don't know how the war is going to proceed. I'm a little dubious that you're right about your assessment, but you could be. I don't know. I mean, we have no way of knowing because our sources are unreliable. Our, our media just lies, uh, one lie after the other, and our sources for um, our alternative sources are based upon what people in Russia are saying. They could be lying as well. But I would say that if you read Putin's speech from two days ago, three days ago, he compares his role, their role, with the role of, uh, in defense of Andrew Murray, in, in, in defense of Andrew Murray, their role with the Tsarist times. And they are, he argues, Putin argues that uh, Greater Russia was not imperialistic. It wasn't like the U.S. It wasn't like these other Western powers he talks about so much. Of course it was. It's just simply a distortion. So if he's as wrong about his, his history, history of Russia, as he is about his own goals, and I'm very dubious, but I think, I think that given our, 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 the areas we don't have any knowledge, of, we don't have any, any for sure information about, we ought to stick to the issue of peace. That's something we do know something about. We do know the devastation. We do know that the Russians have taken enormous losses. They've, they've sort of admitted it. They're having recruiting people now. We know the Ukrainians are taking enormous losses. I don't want to get into who's killing who or who's the uh, zealot here or whatever. The main thing is people are dying. And that ought to be our concern. And as, as Lenin said, we should be in a position to hope that our support to end the war would energize the working classes of both countries to overthrow capitalism. And that's what we should be about. Okay, Mark, you're next. Mark Abelson. Yes, thank you. Uh, Greg, within your research on um, imperialism and empire overall, uh, which obviously was voluminous here, uh, I'm just curious if you ran into a character by the name of Albert Beveridge, Senator from Indiana in 1898. Did you hear, you, you, you run into this character? Was he part of the Anti-Imperialist anti League? Well, he, he was the one who uh, in 1898, when America went to war against the Spanish and got Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, and we become an imperialist power. He stated in 1898, that from here, that 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 people who believe that market does not that governments do not determine price ought to ask the question why England is still in South Africa, Egypt, and India. In other words, he's telling us that at that that this thing known as free market, yeah, that exists on Main Street with convenience stores, barber shops, and hardware stores. But when it comes to, and keep in mind in 1898, we are on the cusp of transferring fuel, uh, getting off coal for navies and we're going on oil. That's where we're going. And so things such as oil, gas, gold, and silver are not determined by free market. They are determined by great powers. That's, that's the message here. And I was just wondering if you stumbled onto this gentleman. Well, I think he was part of the anti-imperialist league. As I mentioned, we were the, uh, our country, the U.S. was the centerpiece of anti-imperialist activity at that time, precisely for reasons that you just gave. And that anti-imperialist league ranged from Andrew Carnegie, the capitalist, all the way to Samuel Gompers, the head of the AFL, from Mark Twain through, so I'm sure he was one of those members as well. We were the 
centerpiece as we enter the age of imperialism for anti-imperialism. Yeah, so yeah, but at the same time, uh, man, the United States is still practicing manifest destiny. In other words, the Spanish-American right. War, which nobody really consults anymore anyway, was a linchpin in American history. You know, by 1898, Chesapeake Bay is linked with the Golden Gate. And no longer is it Ma and Pa Kettle grabbing land 10 miles over the next hill from the Plains Indians. It's now going to be the Army, the Navy, the U.S. government, the businessman, and the banker. We have now joined the group of imperialist powers. That's where we went. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. And then, Stephen, um, it's your turn, but please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Greg. Uh, I really appreciate your, your uh, careful uh, consideration of these matters. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm speaking from uh, the island of Hawaii, which in 1893 was indeed uh, uh, taken by, by force and, uh, and became an imperial uh, own, own ownership or, or a vassal of, of the United States. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, the importance of building the peace movement, I, I wanna concentrate on that. That's, that's the most important thing I think we need to do in our communities, in the, in the country and in the world. And it's rela that relationship of building uh, the relationship, that project of building the peace movement has to be um, founded on our class interest. And, and um, I don't hear enough about uh, working class interests and the class struggle on the level of, of how workers are actually struggling to, to uh, emancipate themselves from this oppression uh, that capitalism and imperialism has imposed upon them. Uh, and this goes across the, the, the uh, national boundaries. I think, I don't know what's going on inside of China with regard to the struggle of the workers, you know, how their organization is actually being um, uh, tended to. I, I don't know how it's being done in Russia right now. You know, I know that the Soviet countries all had um, uh, people growing up with that concept of, of worker betterment um, high on the agenda, but I don't see how that's working now. And, and, I, and I, I think in building the peace movement, particularly in the United States and its and Hawaii, um, it's important that, that we uh, attach that ideological foundation of, of worker interests, of, of class consciousness to this uh, project of building the peace movement. So that's uh, not really a question, but that's my comment. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, and I agree. And um, I think the element that's missing is uh, a communist vanguard in the peace movement. I mean, we can't allow the peace movement to be uh, directed and, and pushed uh, towards pacifism. It has to have class content added to it. And the, force, uh, the people that I see doing that are people like the people on this Zoom who identify with Marxism and communism. So they have to be active in it. They can't be on the sidelines. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just go over this back. Um, uh, as, as I recorded it, um, it's Nina Wax goes next, then Sharon Rose. Then I inserted myself there, followed by Charlie, Janet, Jean, Raj, and Norma. Hopefully I got everybody all the hands. So Nina, would you like to unmute? Yeah, um, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess, you know, I'm a bit old fashioned. I believe in democracy because it actually, it, people can actually, um, how should I say, have themselves represented, you know? And um, so uh, I know that that's uh, sort of, uh, well, it's not been popular with the so-called, uh, well, with our committee, if one was called that. Yeah, Nina, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I, I, okay, I, well, let's hear the question. It's please. not a question. I, I want to say something that I think that if this ends up as being, how should I say? It, could you could you it, ask it, a question to the speaker? Uh, because we we've, we've gone over this almost every. No, we haven't. And you have, and you haven't spoken to that, and you won't. 
Okay, so our next speaker is Sharon Rose, please, Sharon. I think that Richard Wright was next. Isn't that right before me? Um, you're absolutely right. I, I let let Richard go first. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> uh, Greg, I wanted to thank you for a great presentation. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's um, well, it's just very it's nice to um, hear hear the historic uh, group uh, roots and all that. I wanted to uh, hit on some points that were brought up um, uh, earlier by. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? I wanted to hit on some points um, that were brought up earlier uh, around the peace movement, if you will. Uh, for one thing, uh, um, uh, I think I've I think I've detected a turn uh, on the on the on the uh, on the Ukraine front. I think I've detected a, a term uh, a little bit broader uh, from strictly the the bipolar Russia versus uh, U.S. or U.S. versus Russia and total support. Uh, well, uh, uh, for the U.S. against Russia uh, against Russia. Uh, I'm seeing more and more uh, more of this equitable uh, handling of, of the situation. Secondly, um, I think that the, the peace movement uh, takes more credit for itself uh, in the historic development uh, than it's really due. Uh, in point of fact, I think that what really what really turned the war around in Vietnam was a lot of body bags coming back to you know to, to rural America. Um, and the peace movement, by and large, was restricted to the college campuses. It was, in fact, the elites leading the elites. Um, so, you know, so I'll get back to my, my thing that we need to get off the college campuses and out into the communities. Um, the, the third thing is, is that lately I've been uh, 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 seeing some things from, from uh, um, uh, Code Pink, uh, I think it was an interview with Max Blumenthal, and then there was another interview, uh, uh, I forget exactly who did it, um, but they are becoming very uh, unenamored with the political direction uh, that, they, that they're seeing. They're not getting, they're knocking on doors and not getting in. They're becoming really frustrated with, uh, with trying to change the, uh, you know, the military budget. They're, they need, they, I think I begin to see the signs of of the peace movement, uh, maybe question itself on onto its modes and methods, and and really an unnecessary examination of where we sit vis-a-vis -vis U.S. capitalism. And with that, I'll shut up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, I'm encouraged too, Richard. I I, I find that uh, um, I think the reality sort of hit people who were in the camp of expecting a glorious march through uh, to Kiev and the overthrow of the, the fascist infected, not a fascist government, fascist infected government. When, when the Russians called up 300,000 people, I think reality set in for a lot of people and they're looking at it as a war now, not as a glorious uh, liberation. And I think that's important and it's making it's sobering a lot of people up. Um, and, and, and people are waking up to the fact that the Democratic Party is just solely behind, including the squad behind aiding and supporting Ukraine. And I think thirdly, the fact that we are in this inflationary moment in which everyone is scrounging around, we, we can't spend money, we've got to, you know, we, we've got to restrain ourselves. And we're just, we just spent $53 billion to aid Ukraine is also sobering people. So I think this is in step with what Lenin was talking about. Wars like this generate the kind of opposition, the kind of sobriety that we need to attack capitalism, which is something that we've long kind of given up. We're attacking neoliberalism, we're attacking uh, disaster capitalism, all forms of cap, but not capitalism. This maybe will point the, the finger at capitalism. So thank you, Richard, I agree. Okay, and now Sharon. Um, thank you. So I had wanted to raise two points, but my first point was about uh, the anti-war movement. I couldn't agree more with what 
you said, Greg, but other people have also said, said it. So um, it is daunting to think about how to build that anti-war movement, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And I actually, and I absolutely agree that we should have communists in the vanguard of that. Um, I wanted to um, ask a question regarding client states of imperialism. So, um, you know, the US has taken the turn toward Asia with the, um, with the notion, with the notion that they have to build up, that that is, the imperialists have have to build up the Philippines and other client states against China, and um, one particular client state is um, talked about a lot on the left, and that is Israel. And um, there are some people uh, on the left who say that, oh, if if the American people only knew how terrible Israel is with occupation and dehumanization of Palestinians, et cetera, that, that the American people would be opposed to, to Israel. And, and it's the Zionist lobby that is functions to um, control US policy in the Middle East. And, I think that that's just an argument that says the tail wags the dog. The US imperialism would not be pro-Israel if it weren't for the fact that Israel is a client state acting in the interests of US imperialism. And um, I'm just wondering what you what you think about the, you know, the the buildup of various client states around the world who that act um, on behalf of U.S. imperialism. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. I, you know, the, the notion of a client state, mm, you know, we, I won't quibble over language, but the idea that uh, someone is like a police person for the U.S. in a region is an old one. Uh, Iran and Israel were, in that particular era, when the Shah was in power, they were both, you'd call them client states, I'd call them localized police, for the US, uh, Korea, same way. I mean, you can go around the world and find these states that have this kind of dual function. They have their own foreign policy, but they don't, they don't drift away from the US and the US supports them very strongly. Uh, so yes, I mean, I would, I would tend to agree. I think Ukraine wants to be what you call a client state. And I think that's a good way to look at Ukraine today. They want to be a client state. Uh, so, uh, in the sense that we are exposing that and we're talking about that, in, in the sense that we can talk people out of supporting our government support for the Ukraine to be our client state, just as we should talk about keeping Israel from being our client state, I think uh, that's, that's an important part, a role for the left. Okay, thank you. Um, I inserted myself in the stack here. Greg, there's so many things that came up. Um, I, I wish we had hours to go through all these, but I'll just bring up two of them because you, it's been so, it, so your presentation has had a tremendous amount of depth. I want to go back to like theory of imperialism um, and how it's evolved and how it applies today. Uh, after World War II, um, the United States emerged as the world's sole superpower, the only nuclear power. Um, and it imposed a Pax Americana on the world. And that was characterized by two factors. One was um, relative stability imposed by the United States. Um, and then the other uh, aspect of the Pax Americana was an absolute obedience to open markets. Um, and that, that goes back really to um, even a, a pre-imperialist period. Um, of, of capitalism, where the, the thrust of, of global capitalism was toward opening markets. Now we seem to have quite the opposite in terms of U.S. behavior, that U.S. is continually stirring up the pot. It's provoked the war in, um, in Ukraine. I mean, a war that could end in nuclear dis disaster. Uh, but rather than trying to have a stable 
world system. It seems to be pushing for a very volatile system. And then the other part is the amazing thing that the United States has sanctions over a third of humanity. Rather than opening markets, it's closing markets. I mean, had Russia and China said, look, we're not going to accept US goods, the United States would have been up and armed. Yet that's exactly what the United States is doing. So why do we have these two counter activities and how do we fit that into a theory of imperialism? Well, those are those are great questions. I, I uh, they, they, they inspire me to write about them. I hope you write about them. Uh, maybe we can write about them. But uh, as far as the stability imposed on capitalism and the reason there was a deal to allow the U.S. to really reign, much of that has to do with anti-communism. It has to do with that, as I spoke earlier about the pact, the inter-imperialist pact to attack the Soviet Union from its inception until its demise in 1991. So the U.S. was able to impose that because they took that leadership to fight the ultimate enemy, which was socialism, which was an alternative economic system that was not part of the, uh, the capitalist uh, imperialist system. Uh, it's not really true that open markets were always part of it. In fact, the period from the 30s through 1970 um, really were a period where economic thinking was largely Keynesian. And it was a, a crisis just like the one we're going through now with, with um, uh, um, stagnation that really destroyed that. And the answer given then was open markets. I mean, the answer to it, what people call neoliberalism, was essentially the escape hatch for capitalism because Keynesianism had failed. A lot of our comrades still are under the illusion that we can get away, rid of neoliberalism and go back to um, Keynesian stuff. It was debunked in the 70s. That's what it was. It hit the wall in the 70s. And it hits the wall today again. That's why we're having the radical uh, attack upon uh, inflation by the Fed today. So open markets, but, but the core of what you asked, I think the important thing is people thought that this centrifugal force, this, this, this kind of selfishness, this kind of uh, sanction tariff uh, uh, regime uh, was Trumpism. It wasn't Trumpism, it was a ruling class decision. It was where you went after the centrifugal forces created by 2007, 2009 crisis. People underestimate the, 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 the effects of that crisis. It destroyed globalization. Global trade never recovered from that. And so when global trade is not there, then the whole concept of globalization is debunked. And the capitalist world led by the United States went through a regime of of selfishness, of, of me over others, sanctions, and do what I tell you to do, of hanging on to their power, pushing off their problems as we are now with a dollar onto Europe. I'm getting carried away here, but that's because it's a stimulating question, and I don't know, we, we should talk sometime. Yeah, let's I'd, do, I'd like, do that. I'd like to discuss that with you further. Thank you. Um, we're getting, we're getting um, toward the end. Um, you, usually we try to end at, at 12.30, the, the recording part of the session, and have a more informal session after 12.30. Um, but we do have a number of people, hands up. We have, um, let's see, we have Charlie, Janet, Jean, Raj, and Norma's hands up. Um, so we'll continue with those, speak with those questions. And then, um, Greg, if you'd like to, after those, those hands are responded to. If you'd like to make a, a, a summary statement or a final statement, you, you're invited to, or you can pa pass on that. So uh, next is Charlie, please. Yes, um, three quick points. Um, first of all, these sessions always start by reminding us of the 11th thesis. The point is to change the world, not just to interpret it. I want to uh, take note uh, that Greg is one of the rare persons who actually follows this all the way through. It's it's far too uncommon uh, here on ICSS to actually follow through on that. Um, second, uh, some argument is based uh, by some of the people on uh, the uh, situation with the 
Russian ethnic minorities in Eastern Ukraine. And uh, all I can say is what I've learned is how little I've learned that that is a tremendously complicated, uh, tangled web of things to try to untangle and uh, that people should study more before they uh, base uh, their argument on that. And third and most important is uh, just to call attention again to how important Greg's article was when he pointed out that uh, the question, uh, you know, that Lenin's imperialism the, uh, is about the stage of world capitalism. Imperialism is not something that you tick off on each individual country. And we have seen so many arguments that are based on do these five points that Lenin uh, noted, mostly based around, as he summarized it, the concept of mon monopoly capital, do they or do they not apply to Russia? And Greg has pointed out that merely to ask the question is to show that you know, you're not understanding the situation. And so, uh, you know, like I've been confronted with statements like, well, Lenin said that Argentina was not an imperialist country. And I said, uh, that's false, not because it was an imperialist country, but because you shouldn't even be uh, trying to tick off on each individual country. And I asked for, you know, where did Lenin say that? Or, or and of course, you can't find it. Uh, but that's the kind of confusion that uh, is really at the base of a lot of the disagreement here, um, at least conceptually, if not politically, and uh, that we uh, owe a great debt to Greg for trying to clear up with that very important article. Thank you. Any comments, Greg? Uh, thank you, Charlie. I appreciate that. And, and uh, uh, yeah, in Argentina in particular, um, Lenin does speak of Argentina, and he's very explicit. It, it, it's a, a semi-colony. I mean, he talks about British capital and, and how it uh, affects uh, Argentina. So, yeah, I mean, people that say they use those five tick-offs, you give me a platform to go on my rant again. But uh, M. R. Zine had an article, and, and so did uh, 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 someone who publishes me, Communist Review, taking those five, five uh, characteristics and applying them to countries. It's clear as a bell from reading imperialism. But I think, you know, in popular parlance, people have been doing that for years and years and never really looked at it. So, but thank you for your comments, Charlie. Okay, I think the next person is Janet Coburn. Yes, hi. Uh, so thank you, Greg, for your presentation. Uh, I don't think of it as a Russian invasion. I also think Russia is on the right side of history as Scott Ritter is wont to say, um, on the right side of history when it comes to Ukraine right now. I think of what is happening is what Putin said from the start on February 24th. That is, it is a special military operation, an SMO, Article 51 of the UN Charter and a collective security arrangement with the two oblasts, the DPR and the LPR, that Ukraine, the Ukrainian regime had been attacking for eight years since the 2014 Maidan coup, had amassed large forces on the border of the Donbass and appealed for Russia's help. Russia and the DPR and LPR signed treaties to become security partners. So Russia intervened on behalf of those two uh, uh, entities, uh, the Donbass, because they are in security par partnership with Russia. And now after holding referendum, uh, referenda, in which the vote was overwhelming to separate from Ukraine, they became part of Russia. Um, and um, so, how do you reconcile all that, as well as the objectives of the SMO, demilitarization and denazification, with your saying Russia is engaging in so-called imperialism? Thank you. I, I don't want to say they're engaging in imperialism. That's uh, like Hilferding saying it's a policy choice. What I'm trying to say is that capitalism breeds imperialism. 
And that's the lesson of Lenin. And that's explicit in Lenin. And so you, uh, in a real way, I'm being a little bit unfair to, to Russia because Russia is in fact the victim of US imperialism. But that US imperialism is directed at Russian imperialism, Russian economic interest in Europe. That's why the US is supporting Ukraine. They want to get the energy section for themselves. There's no way without this war, Europeans would buy liquid, liquefied natural gas, which costs much more, and then invoke the shipping cost, as opposed to existing pipelines, and build enormously expensive natural gas facilities to get those natural gases from the US if there weren't a war like this. That's the motive for the war. That's what drug them in. And the Russians are understandably trying to defend their own economic interests. Uh, but that's capitalism. Now, the, the, the uh, situation in the Donbas and in Luhansk, um, it's ugly. And I, I, just on a personal level, I would not be opposed to the fact that Russia were giving them arms to defend themselves against the rest of Ukraine, given some of the aggressions that I'm told occurred by Ukraine. That's different than invading. That's very different than invading. You can call it a special military operation, but it's ringing a little bit untrue now when you look at the losses that Russia has uh, sustained. And you look at the now escalation with 300,000 reservists that are going to go into this war. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Then our last three um, people on the stack are Gene, Raj, and Norma, and then we'll have um, the end of, of the formal session. So, um, Gene? Okay, well, again, uh, thanks. I really appreciate this discussion and what everybody has brought into it. I just wanted to say, people have talked about the, um, you know, the, the working class and need for working class solidarity and a working class uh, foreign policy. And I just want to remind everybody that again, the largest working class in the world is Chinese. And uh, they're also the best organized. They have uh, over 300 million people, uh, workers in uh, the All China Federation of Trade Unions. Uh, and again, it's also the most effective. Um, Chinese workers have seen their incomes increase by uh, about 800%. Uh, so that's really tremendous. And these are World Bank statistics. So I, I think uh, we need to look at uh, China and we need to understand the need for working class uh, solidarity on the issue of, of China. And I think that's important and we don't see that very much. And uh, so I just wanted to make that point. I know people may disagree, but uh, that's my point. Thank you. Um, do, you, do you want to comment or should we go on to uh, just briefly, Yeah, I mean, I have to agree. I mean, those are facts. Those are facts. I, I, absolutely, Eugene, they're facts. And when it disputes those facts, they don't know the facts. Raj. Yeah, okay. So uh, I want to add here that uh, I agree with uh, Greg, uh, with you, Greg, that uh, that going towards neoliberalism was a compulsion for a, a global capitalism that was becoming, in Lenin, Lenin's term, moribund in the 1970s onwards, okay? And, and that it, when China acceded to US capital penetration, um, it, uh, it, it solved the problem. It solved the problem of capitalism and China became the factory, you know, the working, uh, the the, uh, the factory for the world. And Chinese workers worked under a cap, you know, socialist party, but nevertheless, capitalism developed. And so already for 200 years, the environmental pollution was increasing. The commons were pollute, polluting, climate change, is uh, was happening, but this this enormous boost in production 
that 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 added the Chinese working class that Jeannie spoke about, and later on Indian working class, have added to uh, to this uh, global climate crisis, which is what we did not have in Lenin's time. So any analysis of imperialism without this factor would be basically uh, not correct. In my opinion, it has, it's a very big factor. And the second aspect of it is that consumerism has been generated. Consumerism as in disposable commodities, cheap commodities, that is, tries to placate the working class a very large section. What Lenin called opportunism in the working class, he said was from the bribing of the working class. And any analysis of imperialism that does not take that into account is incomplete in my opinion. So uh, today I think that uh, consumerism has, has also contributed to that. So we don't see uh, after the fall of Soviet Union and China acceding to capitalist mode of production, any really revolutionary movements in the world for 30 years. And so when we talk about working class, we have to make it a question, uh, we have to ask ourselves a question, what is the way out? Now, all the opposition to imperialism is coming from the right. From Afghanistan, that was a medieval, medievalism that defeated it. And Russia too is challenging US dominance with a right wing ideology, though I don't consider it fascist. So we have those so the two Marxist questions book, now. Yeah, so you, what I'm saying is, is it sufficient to uh, just say imperialism is uh, uh, just a stage of capitalism at this point or should we go further? That's my question to you. Well, it's, yeah, it is important because uh, Part of the problem that you brought up is the fact that uh, right-wing populism controls the, the oppositional uh, line today throughout the world. And I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, it is the dominant oppositional force. You saw it in Italy last week. You know, Maloney wins, the five, goofy five-star movement was up and then it declined. The Liga was the big deal. Now it's on the decline. People are looking for alternatives. And all they get is right-wing oppositional policies and parties. We have to lay that at our doorstep as a left. If you have a left that is distracted, and I don't want to get way off on, on some of the distractions. There are many of them. I'm sure you've discussed them in the past. But one of them is not focusing on the enemy, which is capitalism. So if you have, quote, unquote, anti-capitalist parties or communist parties that, that resist being in the forefront of that of that approach, then you're going to get at a time when people desperately want new answers, you're going to get the growth of right-wing populism. Okay, thank you. I think um, of the, the formal session will be over after Norma makes her question and we get a response on that. So Norma, if, if you could. We actually have Richard uh, Fallenbaum's a first timer. Okay, so, uh, and are you suggesting that because he's first timer, he, he, he our usual policy is, is to have the first timers go for, um, go in front of the, the line. Um, but I, I, in, in this case, I think I would just ask Norma to, to make her, 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 her comments and then we'll, we'll do Richard next. Okay, here we go. Uh, first of all, to notice that I posted in the chat the link to an article titled Tiananmen Square Mass uh, Massacre was a myth. I think it's very informative to understand the players uh, on the overall spectrum. Uh, further, I've commented, the peace movement sort of brought a lot of people together to sit on the sidelines and loudly object for years and years of slaughter of lands and people. The outcome of the struggle is becoming that the US will crumble as people's movements become more and more in everybody's 
all kinds of all different nations of people's movements become more and more influential everywhere. That is, the, uh, the communist underlayment will continue to take over, and the peace movement will become something that was, you know, people had to do something but uh, a peace movement of people standing around and saying, don't do that is not really where we need to go. And a communist struggle is. And all, also with that, the workers' movements are pretty much of little interest too. People don't want to organize to remain enslaved to production and of course to profit, which is unfairly doled out. Greg, do you want to respond or? I'll pass. I'll pass. In the interest of moving on, get another. You want to get another question in? Yeah, let's get Richard. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. Um, um, I guess I'm an exceptionalist. I think uh, Russia is uh, an exceptional country. Um, it had socialism. I had ruled unequivocally by the working class for 70 years and has a as a working class that is um, extremely well developed. I don't agree that um, um, uh, capitalism is, is established in Russia. Uh, um, I think it's not true that the, the capitalist class is the ruling class in Russia. I think there's a struggle, but overall, I think the um, working class is the ruling class in Russia. And I think there's a great deal of evidence. And I think part of, one of the problems that the left has in the West is that they they have fallen for this um, this anti-socialist. Um, they, they they've accepted the notion that Russia and China are both capitalists. So why should they? What alternative is is there? Uh, but but to uh, in, uh, um, go go with right wing oppositionists because there really aren't any left wing oppositionists. Um, uh, the the fact that Russia is not a, a capitalist or or an imperialist country that is not a country that's ruled by the capitalist class. Um, uh, taking it take that away, then you, then you see and you are able to look at the. The, the the war in Ukraine realistically, I think Greg uh, goes through some contortions to um, convince convince himself and us that that the that what what Russia is doing in Ukraine is somehow uh, contemptible, but it, it seems to me quite reasonable. It's it's in line with the. I, I was, you know, I, the, the special military operation reminded me of the the the, the winter war in in um, Finland, um, which uh, Russia ostensibly started, but was a necessary part of World War II. This is uh, a necessary part of World War III, as as. Um, um, President Putin pointed out in his speech. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, Yay. Thanks. Yay. Oh. Fantastic. So, Greg, um, we do have an exceptionalist. So, um, and so please, please feel free to respond and then maybe say some final words. After that, we'll um, end the recording and we'll have a sort of an open discussion that's not moderated. Uh, it's, it's hard to respond to a fundamental factual agreement, disagreement, whether Russia is capitalist or not. Uh, I, I, even though the exceptionalists that I'm aware of don't make that argument. I mean, the folks that in MR Zine and in Communist Review, they preface whatever they say about it being imperialist with, it is a capitalist country, but, so I, I don't know what to say about that. That's a factual disagreement. We'll just have to agree to disagree about, but uh, we have to disagree about the war in Finland too, because I think uh, probably as, as a communist, 
and placing myself in history at that moment, I probably would have supported that war and understood the logic. But I think since that time, many people, many communists have said that wasn't a necessarily advisable war. It might have been a tactical mistake. So that's perhaps not a good analogy. But let me just finally say, because China comes up again and again, I think in both Russia and China, there are forces that are for progress. There are forces for socialism. There are militants for socialism. The fact that in China, there's a communist party in power is significant and can't be ignored by some of our friends who say it's not, it's a capitalist country. On the other hand, the reality is that there's capitalism in China as well. And they have their interests. And it's, I think, impossible to argue that their interests are capitalist interests. I mean, it's just, just that's realism fundamentally. And so uh, how that plays out, I hope it plays out in, in the right way. And there are encouraging signs. And sometimes they're not so encouraging signs. But I think the reality of participating in the capitalist system and the imperialist, not so much the imperialist system, I won't make that charge, but the capitalist system brings you back to reality if you are um, progressive. And I think it has shaken up the Communist Party in China to the point where they are uh, reassessing that relationship. There's been an argument that runs through this. Well, there's imperialist and there's imperialist. There's big imperialist and little imperialist. Well, I'll ask you to consider this, this analogy. There are capitalists and they're big capitalists and they're little capitalists. This is true. And the big capitalists are the bad, bad guys. The little capitalists, capitalists are the less bad guys. But no one would defend the little capitalists. I mean, no one would say that's, that's uh, part of the struggle for socialism is defending the little capitalists against the big capitalists. And I think that's what breaks down when we look at imperialism and the various people in that hierarchy. Uh, if in fact, Russia's acts turn out to in many ways weaken in the system of imperialism, I'm all for it. I don't see it. And I'll conclude with that. Thank you very much, Greg. And I hope this discussion has provoked everybody to work harder to build a peace movement and to build a movement for, for ending this war. Um, I'm very pleased with the the, the discussion. Greg, Greg um, gave us a lot to think about. The, the commentators were also really excellent. So th thank you to everybody. Um, I think we can end the recording now and go into the informal session. And um, as moderator, I'm going to take a break for a moment and just allow people to chat informally. <laughs>
1-800-998-94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml Info for information write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org